This way. stopped at a pole. <laughs> Good morning. Um, yeah, today I've got a new series starting of true crimes. I think you're going to enjoy it because they're all related. Yeah, and it's also all or nothing day. Yep, this is the day you just go big or go home. <laughs> Stay tuned. journey here that journey chick over on instagram welcome to another edition of crafting and crime daily don't forget to hit the like button today he was supposed to dry my hair for me but he didn't do a very good job after i got out of the shower so um hit the like button on your way in or out of the show please consider subscribing and don't forget the notification bell because you don't want to miss a single episode and down below where you hit the like button if you just look all the way over there's a thanks button where you can make a one-time donation that goes to help support the content of the channel or you can just become a member of the channel yeah it's free to subscribe though absolutely free just subscribe anyway today is national all or nothing day this is the day where you just if there's something you've been hemming and hawing about just jump in and do it just you know dive into the waters and do it you know this is this is the day to do it make you know like i've said i uh, it's i'm it's all or nothing for me i want to go someplace else and live out the rest of my life i want it to be something serene something comfortable you know, so it's all or nothing for me. I want it, yes. I don't want to live. I mean, this house is nice. I don't, you know, this house is fine if you put it somewhere else. <laughs> like I want a little bit of land, I want it all. I want it all, all or nothing, yeah. I could even, I could even picture myself, well, no. I was gonna say I could picture myself living in a tiny home, but I have too much craft supplies. I'd need a tiny house for the craft supplies and then one for me. Yeah, <laughs> and then one for the animals. <laughs> oh God, Rebecca, you're being silly. Yes. So let's talk about knitting for a second here. I redid it. Um, my tension is all over the place. And then I went to start the next row and I kind of screwed up. So I think I'm gonna start it all over again. <laughs> I've started this thing all over again about six, seven times. But, I, I, you know, if you go back three years to when I was crocheting, I remember this one hat. I probably started that hat over at least ten times. You can ask Nareda because she, she and I were doing the same pattern. She was struggling. Uh, uh, she was on the struggle bus as well. Um, otherwise, you know, it, it doesn't look too bad. But, yeah, so I'm going to start over. Or, well, actually, I don't know if I need to start over. Um, I think I can salvage this, but I just need to watch the video for the next row about, because what I'm confused about is whether I am taking, like when I, whether I'm going this way or this way. Yeah, I know that sounds like a silly thing, but uh, in knitting, it makes a difference, yeah. Okay, so I got a good for show for you today. Yes, I am going to, in Crafting and Crime, I am covering the trial of Nicholas Cruz. It, this is the trial to determine whether he gets the death penalty or not. He has already pled guilty to many, many, many counts of murder, attempted murder. Um, yeah. So this is just to decide whether he gets the death penalty. So yesterday, we heard from a, a one student who was injured. Um, he, 
he was shot in uh, the back, but he recovered. He says he still has, um, you know, when he works out, he can, he can feel it, uh, you know, it's a little sore when he works out. Um, nice kid, nice kid. He's in college now. So then the next couple of witnesses were crime scene detectives. So one of these detectives, actually his job was to, they all had different like quadrants that they were assigned because this was such a huge crime scene. This was a three story building where the crime happened in the hallways, uh, in the stairwells, in the classrooms, on three different floors. It was just ginormous. So the one officer was assigned to this particular entrance um, or exit, it's the same thing. But uh, he found the jacket that Nicholas Cruz shed on his way out the door so he could blend in with the other students and the weapon, they were just kind of sitting there. So the entire courtroom gets to see the weapon. Um, they also got to see the case it was, I think, I didn't get a close look at the case. Well, I didn't get a close look at anything, but we see the, the weapon was, oh my God, it's huge, huge. It just gives me the creeps. Um, and then like this guitar case that he carried things in, um, that carried all of the magazines and stuff in. And then, yeah, so it was the jacket, the guitar case and the weapon all there in that quadrant. Then we hear from another crime scene detective and they, they walk through each quadrant and what was found and the, the amount of casings in each quadrant. And oh my word, it's just most ridiculous. Uh, then the afternoon was medical examiner time, two different medical examiners. Um, one, each did a couple of autopsies. So now, I think by now we have heard five, six, eight autopsies. And now there, there may have been some that I missed the day before, but it, let me tell you, I'm not going to go into it like I did yesterday because it's just gruesome. It's gruesome. They were all shot multiple times. Uh, the, the, the blast did tremendous amounts of damage wherever the entrance or exit wounds were on the body. And like I said, there were multiple from head to toe, literally head to toe. Um, yeah, so I think that's all I need to say about that. The family members were in the courtroom, um, listening to the medical examiner describe, describe what was in the photographs. You know, they were not allowed to see the photographs, but I, I can imagine that they've probably already seen the photographs in the past. Um, and naturally very emotional, but it's, it's really sad. I think I mentioned it, there, there are therapy support dogs on um, on site there. There's a, actually a room that the family members can go to. There's therapy dogs in there, you know, that where they, if they need some stress relief or trauma relief, um, these people and these animals are there to assist. And, you know, I, I would like to say that the courtroom is not as crowded as it was at the beginning, but it still is. It still is just depending on, you know, what, what's going on each day. And I, they must be told, I think, you know, there are victim advocates that are involved with all these families that work for the court and they know what witnesses are being called when and what they're going to discuss. So they, they're keeping the families apprised. And if it involves their loved one, then that's where they're present in the courtroom. All right. So I have, that's it for that. I don't want to talk about that anymore. <laughs> I know my hair is wet. I'm trying to get it to dry. So I want to talk about this case. One of my, my subscribers asked me if I would cover this case. And I my response was, well, if it ever goes to trial, if the guy doesn't plead guilty, I'd be happy to cover it. But then I started hearing about this case and I thought, oh my word, <laughs> there's way more to this than I could have even imagined. Um, this case involves at least five, I said 10, five untimely deaths 
that are shrouded in secrecy. This comes out of South Carolina with the Murtaugh family. And in South Carolina, that is pronounced Murtaugh. So the Murtaugh family, I mean, they're like the Kennedys of the South. Yeah, these people are well situated. They've got money, they've got influence, and throughout the years when all of these events have occurred, like I said, shrouded in secrecy because nobody wants to talk. Everyone's afraid of them. The cops are in cahoots with them. And the Murtaugh family goes back a hundred years, four generations of being the county prosecutor. Now this is one of the poorest counties in South Carolina, um, but they are the prosecutors nonetheless. Now the current nuclear family is Alex and Maggie Murtaugh and their two sons, one of which is named Paul. The older son doesn't have much to do with any of this. Well, we'll see. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a strange one. So I, by the time I get all of this covered, it's going to cover many episodes. So I just kind of wanted to give you an overview of what is going on. I think if I could do it in just a timely fashion. So you may have seen Alex Murtaugh's name recently in the news as he has been charged with the death of his wife Maggie and son Paul. But this starts way back before that in 2015 with the death of a boy named Smith. Stephen Smith is, uh, he's an openly gay young man in, in this town that's probably not kind to him and he is found dead in the road one night. And after all is said and done, this is ruled as a hit and run, even though he has amazingly awful blood force trauma to his head and no sign of any vehicle involvement. No, no vehicle on the scene. Well, that's why they said it was a hit and run, but no tire marks, no skid marks, no, nothing, nothing. Just this guy's body in the middle of the road. And it was a cold case for a very, very long time. But recently, after the deaths of Paul and Maggie, the son and the wife, during the investigation of the deaths of Paul and Maggie, the case of Stephen Smith was reopened based on the findings in the investigation of the double murder. I know. So that's one murder right there. Well, hit and run. That's death number one. So death number two comes a few years later. This is Paul. This involves Paul, the son. He is out in a boat with five of his friends, all six of them. They're, you know, he's 19. They're all, you know, teenagers. They've been out all day long on the boat. They've been drinking. A lot, most of them are underage. Um, and that night, about two o'clock in the morning, there's a 911 call that this boat has hit a bridge. And there is a young woman named Mallory Beach, a beautiful girl. She was sitting on her boyfriend's lap and she is ejected from the boat and not found for seven days. That's mysterious death number two with the Murtaugh family name on it because there's a big issue as to who was driving the boat. Um, Paul Murtaugh is finally charged with three counts of driving, you know, like DUI, but involving a boat. Driving under the influence, but involving a, a, a boat. Death number three comes a year after the boating accident when the Murtaugh's housekeeper slips and falls in the home. We don't know any of the details regarding, you know, other than she slipped and fell, but there was a wrongful death suit filed by this woman's family. Her name was Gloria Setterfield. 
her family filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the Murtaugh's and they settled it for a half a million dollars. Now, what's going on there? So that's death number three. So four and five come a year later. There's a phone call to 911 made by Alex Murtaugh about 10 o'clock that night from his home. And he's in a panic. He has found his wife and son out by the dog kennels and they are both dead. Shot by different weapons. What? Yeah. Each one was shot by a different weapon. None of the dogs are, were dead, but Maggie and Paul were dead. So that's five, five people, five mysterious deaths. That's not the end of the crime spree though, guys. It keeps going. Now, I might add that the murders of Paul and Maggie happened three days before Paul was scheduled to appear in court on the boat, boating accident case. So did that make that go away? I don't know. Uh, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cover each one of these mysteries separately in a, in a separate episode. So we will start with the case of Stephen Smith. Now, let me finish telling you about this, the rest of the crimes. So uh, months later we get Alex. Now, Alex has a rock solid alibi for the murder of his wife and son. His father was critically ill in the hospital dying and he's in his, he's there with his father. And he had stopped by his mother's house on the way home. He gets home around 10 o'clock, but the medical examiner says those murders happened about 9, 9.30. So he's got a rock solid alibi. And lo and behold, his father passes away about three days later. Then we fast forward. There's a night where Alex Murtaugh is out driving around in his truck, just driving erratically around and stops to change his tire when he says he was, a truck came, made a U-turn, someone got out and started shooting at him. Well, he survived his injuries. He, he called 911, he survived his injuries, he goes to the hospital. Then all of a sudden we get an apology. He doesn't say for what, but then he's going to go to rehab for drug addiction. He is mysteriously fired from the family law firm, disbarred. The county prosecutor who is no longer a Murtaugh, but associated and supported by the Murtaugh family named Dusty Stone, recuses himself from the case, the double murder case. Yeah, that's not the end. No. More recently, Information has come to light. Not, we don't know what the, it's, it's not well lit to us, but to the police. And Alex was named as a suspect and charged with the murders of his wife and son. He's in jail now, charged with 74 counts of something. We're gonna go over all that, but I'm gonna need like a chart <laughs> to keep track of all this. like. Yeah, but I want to be as thorough as possible and bring you all the details because this is a huge puzzle. Like, what's going on with this family, really, that all these things are happening? It's just crazy. What day in history is this? This is the day that I gave birth to my daughter, Raina. Raina Marie Schilling, who is now... 37 years old, 37 years ago. I, let me think, was in labor. I'm trying to think, I have a, 
you know, your memory kind of fades after 37 years. I want to say both of my kids were born in the afternoons. Raina probably a little, uh, I don't know, both in the afternoons. I'd have to look. But she, she was my problem child. <laughs> as far as delivering. Um, I delivered her and then um, as I was being wheeled out of the delivery room, my IV infiltrated. Now, after you give birth, you're given um, a dose of what they call Pitocin through your IV. It causes your uterus to contract to prevent bleeding. Well, my IV infiltrated. Now, I'm sure everything's different today. I'm sure they do, you know, wonderful things but this is how it was 37 years ago so I wasn't getting any Pitocin so a couple hours later I started having labor pains again and I tell the doctor I, I think I'm having another baby I'm like that this is bad and um, I mean I he was hollering get her back to the delivery room and I'm thinking this cannot be another baby it wasn't another baby. It was a huge clot. I was hemorrhaging. So um, once I got the clot out, then like this doctor stayed with me all night long to make sure I was okay. They couldn't, the only place that could get an IV into me to get fluids back into me was in my foot. I had an IV in my foot. Um, yeah, then I, Everything, you know, I think it's going smoothly, swimmingly after that. I go home and I start hemorrhaging at home. And they have to rush me back. My husband had, someone had to come over and watch my baby. They rushed me back to the hospital where I had to have a DNC. Um, I had to go in for an operation. Because apparently what had happened was my daughter was delivered by a resident. And I do remember this very clearly that things were kind of rushed during the delivery and you can't rush a baby or a placenta that comes out after the baby. If you do, some of it might break off and be retained. Well, that's what happened. This resident was a little too vigorous. It's okay. They were learning. Um, but I had to go back in for an operation where they had to take out the rest of the placenta uh, that I had retained so I would stop hemorrhaging I know, it's crazy. So I was told then, you probably shouldn't have any more children, at least for a few years. I didn't. Those, I had my bookends. I had my boy, had my girl, perfectly happy with them. And thank God, they turned out to be pretty good adults. <laughs> they survived me being their mother. Yes, they did. Bless their hearts. Raina is... I know I'm talking about my daughter. I don't talk about her a lot. She is a surgical technician. She went to one semester of college. And when I saw her grades, I drove her to the technical school. I said, I want you to sit through this orientation and pick a career. So she did. She came home. She goes, I want to be a surgical technologist. One year. And she became a surgical technologist. I'm very proud of her. Very proud of her. And I think, I don't know if she's doing that now. I think she's maybe running a medical office. Um, she's really good at managing people in offices, medical offices. She's done that for many, many years. Um, she did that for many years in Florida. Uh, she had bought a home in Palm Beach. I'm so proud of that girl, really. She had bought a home in Palm Beach. She has a partner that she lives with. Uh, they have been together for four or five years. He's a really, really sweet guy. Um, you know, I keep saying, when are you gonna get married? Oh, I don't say that anymore because she gets pissed off, but <laughs> I think it a lot. And of course, no, no grandchildren from her. Also touchy subject, yeah. But she's doing really, really well. You know, she moved up to North Carolina to help take care of her grandparents after her father passed away from COVID. Um, and they've been, you know, her boyfriend went with her and she's done really well. She's up in the Asheville area and she loves it. And um, she's doing really well for herself. So that's what happened this day in history. 
37 years ago. Are you guys participating in The Great Escape? Is there somewhere you want to go that you can diamond paint? Like this cabin in the woods? Oh, who wouldn't want to go to this cabin in these woods? It's gorgeous. Yeah. If you have any kind of landscape and you want to participate, we have 11 amazing sponsors, many diamond painting companies, uh, accessory companies. I can't name them all. I'll put them right here. Um, but it doesn't start till August 1st. So all you have to do is join the Crafting Journey Facebook group. You have to subscribe to the YouTube channel for Crafting Journey and Mickey Sunshine Creates. She's my partner in crime. And you have to fill out a Google form. This gives us all your information. Um, Cause we're gonna be having like, you know, all these sponsors are giving away prizes and discounts and yeah, like amazing stuff. Like diamond painting drills. I tease people with this. I can't show you what's in here, but they have put together something just for the event that's gonna be for sale during the event. Sparklers, you know, diamonds that no one has ever seen before. No other company carries these, specially made for this company, Diamond Painting Drills. The link is down in the description if you wanna check out their other merchandise, but you might wanna wait till, you might wanna join the event, wait till August 1st, see what this is, get the discount. Now, I don't know if you'll be able to use the discount on this, product, but if you see something else you like, you'll be able to use the discount. Yay! We got a pen turner. Um, oh my goodness. Two pen turners. One that does uh, the uh, resin pens, one that does clay pens. Yeah. Amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. All right. I have chatted on uh, long enough today. So tomorrow we're going to start with the Marta cases. We're going to start out with the case of Stephen Smith. Short show for you today. Um, gotta go to work. I love you all.